Hey gadget groupies, it's time to chat iPhone 6s. Apple's TikTok iPhone cycle has delivered a more powerful and refined iPhone in a familiar candy-colored shell. Starting off with the hardware, the design remains virtually unchanged from last year's model. The only change we might be able to point to is a 0.1 to 0.2 millimeter increase in the thickness of the casing. This is a largely imperceptible change, but testing out rigid cases, I couldn't quite snap on a life-proof case for the iPhone 6. My stylus camera case fit together perfect though, so your mileage might vary. It's the same overall look and feel, but I'll happily give Apple props for reinforcing the casing to reduce concerns over bendability. The front face holds the same 4.7 inch retina display. The actual screen resolution is 1334 by 750, so it's not going to win any awards for pixel density, but it's a nice enough looking screen. It isn't the brightest though. Outdoor viewability is only slightly better than the G4, and it's absolutely pantsed by the high brightness mode on Samsung phones. At the top of the phone, we have a new 5 megapixel front facing camera capable of shooting 1080 Video. The bottom of the phone holds the home button, which doubles as a fingerprint scanner. This hardware maintains Apple's forehead and chin bezels, keeping the 6S about mid-pack in terms of screen-to-body ratio. The right side of the phone holds the power button and SIM card tray. The left side of the phone has split volume keys and the mute switch. The top of the phone ain't got nada, and the bottom edge of the phone has the 3.5 millimeter headset jack, main calling microphone, lightning connector, and main loudspeaker. We have a separate video where you can hear that speaker in action, but spoiler alert, it's just okay. The back of the phone is a smooth slab of aluminum with attractive antenna cutouts, and the top of the back plate holds the new 12 megapixel camera, a secondary microphone, and the dual LED flash. Like all previous S model phones, there's virtually nothing to distinguish it from the number model years. So new for this season is this pinkish rose gold color. I totally called this back during the release of the new MacBook. As Apple stays fairly conservative with their hardware design, they'll be offering up new colors as clear indications of who spent money to own the latest and greatest. I mean, space gray, come on, that's like so iPhone 5S. It just wouldn't do to be seen with an out of season iPhone, would it now? But seriously, I am happy to see a top tier manufacturer adding more color options to their lineup. I got spoiled by Nokia of flagships and Moto Maker can create some beautiful devices. Apple fans now have another color option to better suit their individual style, though I'm probably not cool enough a dude to pull off a pink phone. I am happy to report that seams on the iPhone 6S are cleaner and better pieced together than last year's phone. I can't see or feel any breaks or gaps which might pull hair. Focusing on what's new this year, we have 3D Touch. Sensors in the iPhone screen register how hard you press into the screen, and certain levels of force can deliver additional functionality. I'm a big fan. As Apple has added more features and functionality to iOS, our poor little home buttons were kind of getting overworked. We all know Apple was never going to give us other controls like back and multitasking buttons, so this is a pretty clever solution for ergonomically navigating an increasingly complex computing device. We're only just scratching the surface on what this force touch might be capable of, but already it's a handy feature. Previewing messages, getting contextual menus for apps, and sliding through multitasking cards as a force gesture. The haptic feedback pulses give a clear indication of how hard you've pressed, which very quickly trains the user on how to use the feature. It's already so smooth that it's a little disappointing when an app doesn't have a 3D touch function and you end up with just a generic long press on your screen. I would like to see better conveyance on which apps do provide this additional functionality. Overall system performance is snappy. There's never really ever been an issue with new iPhones navigating the user interface. Game performance is buttery smooth, and apps like Future Fight are able to incorporate some pretty fancy particle and lighting effects. This shouldn't be surprising though, as the CPU-GPU combo here is driving just a little more than one quarter the pixels on screen as a Samsung Galaxy S6. Now, I certainly wouldn't claim that gaming performance is almost four times better than the Galaxy S6 by comparison. It always takes me a while to get used to using an iPhone again. I'm largely able to get my work done during the day, but iOS still seems to require users to jump through more hoops for things like file management. It's 2015, and there are still a surprising number of situations that require you to plug your phone into a proper computer and manage through iTunes, like loading a video file on the phone to test the speaker. This video file is saved in OneDrive and Dropbox, but I still need a computer and iTunes to save it on the phone. Or when using my high-quality Sennheiser Lavalier clip-on mic, the audio files this app saves are very large. 
And the only cloud solution this app supports is Dropbox. I can't look for the audio files in, say, a file manager app and upload them to OneDrive. Well, it's faster to just plug the phone into a PC and drag the files off. But if you don't have iTunes, you won't have access to any of the files you've created through third-party programs. It's disappointing that in this day and age, Apple is still this draconian in how they restrict users from controlling their own content. App integration has gotten better, though. You have more access to services for sharing content like photo uploading. We're still a long way off from the app support found in Windows Phone and Android, but I am happy to see progress here. And this is such a small tweak, but I can't tell you how happy I am to see that Apple has finally updated the keyboard to show lower and uppercase characters while typing. It only took them nine generations of iPhones to do it, but we've made it, baby! Huzzah! Any more, though, I'm more interested in apps and services which have the broadest reach across all platforms. I don't like investing time in a solution which only some of my friends can interact with. I'm more apt to suggest video calls over Hangouts or Skype than I am over FaceTime. I use Dropbox and OneDrive since I can access those across all devices easily. Ditto streaming music services, as I just can't invest in Apple Music if I can't take that account with me to an Android or Windows device. Microsoft Document Solutions guarantee the broadest compatibility when collaborating. Google Maps and Waze still offer superior navigation options. The only Apple services I might use are localized to only Apple use case scenarios. iCloud, for example, is only used to back up my iPhone. I can't really trust it for anything else. Moving to the camera, it finally gets a resolution bump and is now capable of UHD video. We have the most comprehensive review available linked below this video for those who want to see this camera in action. Spoiler alert, while more pixels are nice for cropping, zoom, and additional detail, the optics on this camera and sensor size are the same as last year's iPhone. This new front-facing camera delivers nicer results than last year's phone, and the screen can now be used as a flash to help better illuminate your selfies. So that's fun, but I do wish that Apple had outfitted this camera with a wider angle lens. Camera app performance is quick, and even though the resolution has been bumped up, we still get one of the smoothest and fastest burst modes on any phone. I can't help but feel like this app is sliding behind, though. Again, Apple started with a focus on simplicity, but as more features get added, it makes navigation more cumbersome. Almost every setting now distracts you away from composing your shot in some way. I think we've evolved beyond needing separate modes for photos and videos, but we need to keep this sliding action if we're only going to have one shutter button. We also have a lot of replicated features, which could be handled with a smarter menu. Slow-mo and time-lapse are types of video. Why have a separate mode for square photos, but not for widescreen pics? It would be nice to shoot photos that don't end up pillar-boxed on your phone screen or TV. Settings like the timer, HDR, and flash require more focus to switch than competing smartphones now. You tap on an easy-to-hit icon, which then slides out a tiny piece of text located on your composition window. Because it changes positions, it can be easy to miss in bright light, and since it's in your composition window, if you miss the tiny text, it'll refocus your shot. There isn't a great reason not to turn these into stationary toggles, as any change still requires multiple taps, but we could keep these taps landing in the same spot instead of moving the target. We have this big square option for activating filters, which are fun, but what if we need to change up a video setting like resolution or slow motion frame rate? Why do we have to leave the camera app, go into the phone settings, and then return? At least when a Samsung blocks my screen for a camera option, I'm still in the camera app, making it pretty easy to adjust and return to shooting. Why can't I tap on a menu in this corner to change a setting like this? For a camera which sells the idea of ease of use, we don't have anything here which approaches the simple mode on LG. And though they've increased the sensor resolution, we still lack a manual mode or support for raw output, leaving behind people who are looking for more professional style controls in their stock camera app. Living photos are kind of fun to play with for a bit, but like I did on my Windows phones, I disabled this feature to save space. The snippets of video are low quality and stuttery. I would highly recommend trying it out though, as it could be a nice safety net feature to capture an important moment. Moving to security, Apple built in a faster fingerprint scanner into the home button, and this continues Apple's lead on other biometric solutions. Unlocking the phone here is faster and more consistent than my experiences using Samsung Sensor. As I mentioned in my Note 5 review, I feel there's a distinct advantage to owning a smaller phone when using a home button fingerprint scanner. The 6S Plus and Samsung Fablets require more of a dance to reach the home button for a scan. This action is easier from an ergonomic standpoint on the smaller 6S. One factor I'm excited to see on the LG V10, as there 
their fingerprint scanner is built into the power button on the back of the phone. Siri brings voice search and controls up to a level closer to what we've been playing with on Google Plus and Cortana. You can initiate a voice search with a Hey Siri command, and there's better integration across your data and services. You can now search for photos by date and location. Like Cortana, you can set reminders based on location. Search now integrates tools like calculators and conversion tables, and Siri can even give recommendations on restaurants around you. These are all welcome updates to a digital assistant which was falling behind the competition. Battery life is another interesting exercise in compromises. The cell in the 6S is about 6% smaller than the battery found in the iPhone 6. Not necessarily a painful reduction, and Apple claims improvements to power management should more than make up that difference. In casual use, I'm inclined to believe them, and standby times here are kind of amazing. When you're not using it, this thing barely sips any juice. Single tasks where the phone can just coast also perform very well. Like in our video streaming test, watching 30 minutes of HD video over Wi-Fi at 50% brightness, the 6S drained about 7% of its battery, making it one of the more efficient performers on this test. I can't say I'm fond of this battery shrinking trend, though. Better standby times are great. But efficiency can't always make up for having a higher capacity battery on board. And when you start taxing this hardware, the smaller battery can drain pretty quickly. Shooting video on the iPhone 6S in airplane mode, the battery drained faster than shooting the same amount of video on the LG G4 with its LTE connection active. And we know the G4 isn't anywhere near as power efficient as the iPhone. If we were comparing them like cars, the iPhone would get better gas mileage but would come with a 40% smaller gas tank. For iOS users concerned about marathon battery life, the 6S Plus is definitely the better phone to shop. Around my neck of the woods, I was getting good signal reception and fast data speeds on AT&T. Apple really has done a terrific job of improving their antenna array over the last several generations of iPhone, and the 6S was a solid and consistent performer around town. According to the built-in field test, signal performance fell just behind the LG V10, but was noticeably lower than the metal and glass Galaxy phones. Lastly, it should be mentioned that this year's base model iPhone still starts users off with only 16 gigabytes of internal storage, which after formatting and activating only offers up about 12 gigabytes for users. This storage gets eaten up very quickly as apps get larger, music and movie collections grow, and the new camera shoots significantly higher resolution photos and videos. Our ability to produce higher quality content from our phones is outpacing our ability to quickly move data onto and off of the cloud, especially over cell phone networks. Thankfully, you can quadruple your storage for $100 more, but that still only brings it up to the same tier as the rest of the smartphone competition, and that pricing is still significantly more expensive than investing in a high-speed memory card. So where does that leave us with the iPhone 6S? Each year I review an iPhone, every new model just continues to reinforce for me that if you upgrade your phone every other year, the S line of phones represents the better track to be on. Every number model iPhone has had some hardware issue that's been fixed on the S model. And this year for the 6S, we also got some great new features like a higher resolution camera and 3D touch. The issue becomes one of fashion. When there's a new form factor, people are a lot more excited than when the S arrives with refined internals and corrections for design flaws. Against the rest of the smartphone ecosystem, Apple brings a high level of polish to their products, but we're still often left in a position where we pay a premium for hardware that feels behind the curve. At the time this video was shot, the 16 gigabyte iPhone 6S will cost you $650 outright. That's about $60 more than a 32 gigabyte Galaxy S6. Apple's 3D Touch is novel, but it largely replaces functionality we already enjoy on Android when we have multiple buttons for control. Running down the list on what these phones have, the Galaxy has three and a half times more resolution on a brighter screen. The Galaxy has twice as much storage and 50% more RAM, a larger battery, an IR blaster to use the phone as a universal remote, a higher resolution camera with a larger sensor, and wireless charging built in. Whether or not you feel a phone needs all these things or you care about any of those features, the fact of the matter is that each of those hardware components costs money. A higher resolution sensor costs more than a lower resolution sensor. A higher resolution screen costs more than a lower resolution screen. You end up paying more for less stuff in Apple land. Whether or not Apple's software, operating system, and design warrant this additional cost will be a question only individual consumers can answer. It should be pretty obvious to those that have watched my videos in the past that the iPhone isn't really my cup of tea. And as a geek who values function slightly more than form, but who would prefer to have both, I just can't personally say that the iPhone represents a great value for money, especially when starting with the 16GB base model. 
Looking at the bang for buck, there's not quite enough here to draw me back to the Apple ecosystem. As for Apple fans, it's silly marketing speak to say this is the best iPhone ever, as we would expect Apple wouldn't put out a worse iPhone than last year's. But I think year-to-year -year upgrades can be underwhelming on any phone. While there are some nice tweaks and updates, I think iPhone 6 owners are probably fine waiting out next year's phone unless they really want to jump on 4K video or 3D touch. Those of you on a 5S or older, though, are in for a nice treat, as the 6S will feel like a much more substantial update. As always, folks, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe for more reviews like these, and I would not be able to continue producing on this channel if you all weren't out there supporting it by hitting the fan funding, grabbing yourself a free audiobook, or shopping for a Loot Crate using the links below this video, or by sharing my videos on your favorite social services like Twitter and Facebook and Google+, and the Reddit. So please keep bringing more cool people to the party. Hit that thumbs up button, and I will catch you all on the next review.